Now the dental implants have become the standard of care for replacing a missing tooth, especially a single tooth after extraction, we've had to modify our technique for how we manage that socket when the tooth is removed. Previously, once the tooth was out, we'd simply cure it out the site and be done. If we're not going to be placing the implant immediately at the time of extraction, we now find ourselves preparing the site for the implant placement a few months down the road by maximizing the amount of bone volume that will be available. We do this via ridge preservation grafting. Once the tooth is extracted, ridge resorption begins, and by ridge preservation grafting, we're minimizing the amount of resorption of the ridge so that when we go to place the implant, we'll have the maximum amount of bone volume to support the dental implant in the edentulous site. The patient we're going to be discussing in this case is an 88-year-old female who was referred to me by her general dentist. About a week and a half previously, she had lost the PFM crown on tooth number 19 and went to her dentist who noticed that there was some recurrent decay underneath the prosthesis. The decay under the crown was fairly deep, so the dentist sent the patient to the endodontist for a root canal uh, in preparation for restoring the tooth. It was the endodontist opinion that the tooth is not restorable and so she was referred to me for extraction of the tooth with replacement with a dental implant. Uh, her medical history is uh, significant for uh, hypertension and hypothyroidism, uh, which are fairly common problems. Her medications included Synthroid and Cozar, or the generic for that is Losartan. And she has no known drug allergies. So basically for the most part, her medical history is not going to have any significant impact on what we're going to do or on our treatment plan. Here's a periapical radiograph of the tooth. And you can see that there is fairly extensive decay and widening of the periodontal ligament space around the root, especially into the furcation area. So this tooth has a pretty poor short and long-term prognosis, which is why the endodontist recommended extraction. So our treatment plan for this patient is to remove tooth number 19 as atraumatically as possible, do ridge preservation grafting at the time of extraction, and then approximately four months later, place a dental implant so that she can have an implant-supported single-unit fixed prosthesis. Because the tooth is infected and we're going to be placing a foreign material into the socket, that being our graft, we want to have this be as aseptic as possible. And so we're going to place the patient on some antibiotics starting two days before and to continue postoperatively. My standard regimen is a chlorhexidine rinse twice a day and cephalexin 750 milligrams twice a day also. I like the two times a day regimen a lot because the patients can remember to do it twice a day and are fairly compliant, whereas if you have a three or four times a day regimen, most of the time the patients will forget one or two doses. I just tell my patients to remember the number two. They have two medications they're gonna be taking two times a day starting two days before until each of the medications is completely gone. If they do it correctly, they should be done with the cephalexin three days post-operatively and the rinse two weeks post-op. So before we take the tooth out, we want to take another look at our periapical radiograph and see what we've got in store for us. You can see that there's fairly extensive decay in the crown, and so there's always the chance that when you take the tooth out that that crown may crumble. But if you look at the roots, it's got a fairly straight distal root that does not seem to be decayed, and the mesial root does have a little bit of a gentle distal curve on it. There's also some bone loss into the furcation and some widening the periodontal ligament space. So hopefully we'll be able to use a cow horn forcep and lift this tooth out without it breaking. But because the tooth is decayed, there's always that possibility. And so in the back of our mind, we're always going to be thinking ahead of what we're going to do if the tooth should break. So after you've given an inferior alveolar, a buccal, and a lingual nerve block with whatever local anesthetic you want, we're going to go ahead and we're going to make a sulcular incision. Uh, we're going to start on the buccal and go about a half tooth on either side of tooth number 19, so on the mesial and the distal. You want to take the blade all the way down to the bone so that we're going to be lifting a clean mucoperiosteal full thickness flap. Uh, of the attached gingiva. We then use the pointed end of a molt number four periosteal elevator to elevate our flap from the bone. You want to make sure that the tip of the periosteal goes all the way down to bone so that you're lifting a clean full thickness flap and then you're going to do the same on the lingual aspect. So once we've got some buccal and lingual mucoperiosteum reflected, we're going to come in with our cow horn forcep that I mentioned earlier. Now there is some fracture of the tooth structure on the distolingual, but uh, we're going to be placing the beaks of the cow horn into the furcation. We're going to do it on the lingual side first and then stick the beaks uh, into the furcation area subperiosteally on, on the buccal surface. We're going to pump the forcep up and down. What that's going to do is that's going to drive the beaks into the furcation deeper and deeper. And as it does, it acts as a class one lever, which will act to hopefully lift the tooth out of the socket. 
Now instead, you notice what it did was it actually split the tooth into half, into the mesial and distal half, which is actually not such a bad thing because the crown's intact. And remember, we have uh, a straight distal root and a curved mesial root. So we're going to separate them further with an elevator, just uh, split the roots a little bit more. And then what we're going to do is we're going to take a standard 62, a universal forcep, and we're going to remove the distal root. And the reason we're going to remove the distal root first is the straighter of the two, and so that's going to come out more easily. The mesial root, remember, was curved distally. It's got a, sort of a soft curve to it. And so now that the distal root's out of the way, that mesial root's going to come out much easier. Now on the lingual, we've got some tooth structure that's missing, but that's okay because we've laid a full thickness flap. We can get our forcep down underneath the periosteum and onto solid tooth structure. And as you can see with the distal root out of the way, that the curved mesial root can be lifted out with a universal forcep uh, without too much difficulty. Now that the tooth is out, our job is only a third of the way done to being finished. So I like to think of an extraction as having three components. The first is removal of the tooth itself. The second is to thoroughly debris the socket of all granulation tissue, infected tissue, uh, any debris in there that can interfere with healing or may serve as a nidus of infection uh, in the site. The third part of the procedure is to then prepare the socket for the eventual implant, and that's the ridge preservation graft, which we'll do next. So you'll notice there's a fair amount of granulation tissue in this extraction socket. And if we look at the radiograph again, you can see the radiolucency within the bone. So we've got a lot of infected material in here that we need to cure it out. And we need to cure this out extremely thoroughly. We don't want to leave any debris in there because, again, that will interfere with healing of our graft and potentially perpetuate chronic infection within the socket, which is the last thing we want in there if we're doing a bone graft. It's not uncommon for the debridement process to actually take longer than the extraction. Now you'll notice also what I'm doing is I'm taking my curved curette and I'm developing a pocket on the lingual, and that's going to help secure our membrane. We're going to use cytoplast in this case. This is a porous polytetraflora ethylene or PTFE membrane. It's essentially like Gore-Tex, but a little bit more porous. Unlike Gore-Tex, which had to be removed if it was exposed to the oral cavity, the cytoplast membrane can be left uh, in situ even if there is dehiscence of the mucosa over it. This is what it looks like out of the package. It's a very flexible, thin, white sheet. And what we're going to do is we're going to contour this to go interproximally between the second molar and the second premolar. We're going to give it sort of an hourglass shape and the idea is to keep it about a millimeter away from the adjacent roots. So we're going to make a little semi-lunar cut on the mesial and the same thing on the distal and then after we've done that we're going to take it into the mouth to make sure that we've trimmed it adequately. When we handle this membrane we want to make sure that we don't puncture it so we're going to use a non-toothed adsin forcep in order to pick up and carry the membrane. So we're going to carry it gently into our extraction site. We've elevated our flap and undermined on the buckle, so we're going to slide it into that pocket first that we've developed. And as you can see there, it is properly trimmed to fit in approximately. The other end is going to be tucked in on the lingual. My preferred grafting material for this use is Mineros, which is a calcified cortical and cancellous graft. Uh, which has particle size between 600 and 1200 microns. And so now we're going to build up our thoroughly debrided extraction socket with Mineros. If the patient is under IV sedation or general anesthesia, we'll actually draw back some of the blood and mix blood uh, directly with the graft material. In this case, we mixed it with saline because the patient's awake and we didn't draw any blood. We want to pack the material into the socket, into the defect, such that there's no dead space within the graft but it's not overly packed, so it's not overly dense. It takes a little bit of practice just to learn exactly how firm to pack it, but really uh, it's a pretty short learning curve. We blot the graft periodically to remove the excess uh, blood or fluid from the graft so that we can condense it nicely. And as a general rule, uh, you're going to use about a half a cc of bone per root. So for a molar, which has two roots, we're going to use as a good rule of thumb, one cc of bone. The same holds true for maxillary molars and the uh, anterior teeth and premolars generally since they have a single root they'll require about a half a cc of bone. Once we've completely filled the extraction socket with bone then we're going to go ahead and we're going to uh, take our membrane and we're going to tuck it in on the lingual into that pocket we developed. And again remember when we're handling the membrane we want to use a non-toothed adsin forcep. So we're going to put the lingual part of the membrane into that uh, into that pocket 
and then we're going to suture using the cytoplast suture. I like to start with a figure eight suture where I start on the lingual and go from inside to outside, then carry that over to the buckle, and again go inside to outside, and then we'll carry that back over again to create our figure of eight. The reason I like to do it this way is that uh, if you catch the membrane at all with the needle, rather than uh, pulling the membrane out, it actually helps uh, pull the membrane down in. So then we're going to go ahead and tie our surgeon's knot uh, to secure the membrane in place. So we're going to do now with the uh, cytoplast suture, it's a little stiffer, has a little more memory than a silk suture or any suture that you're used to. So I always put an extra throw into it. I put a total of four throws into it rather than three. Then we're going to go into the interdental papilla area on the mesial and do the same thing on the distal. And we're going to just do a simple interrupted suture uh, in each of those areas. And again, because the suture has a little memory, it's kind of a kind of a stiff suture, or it tends to unravel rather, uh, we're going to put an extra throw into it. So there we've sutured on the mesial, and now we're going to do the same thing on the distal to hold the interdental papillas in place. So we'll finish off by tying off this distal interdental papilla suture. And uh, as you can see, the tissue comes together very nicely. By elevating our flaps, we're actually bringing the uh, attached mucosa just a little bit more coronally. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and irrigate this off real well. You can see that we've got the membrane nicely tucked uh, underneath the uh, flap of tissue on the buckle and on the lingual. So the membrane is resting between the alveolar bone and the mucoperiosteal flap on both the buccal and the lingual aspects. That's going to protect our graft while it's healing and because of how it's tucked underneath the mucoperiosteal flap, the membrane itself will not displace until we're ready to take it out. If you don't undermine the buccal and lingual flaps enough so that the uh, membrane is tucked well underneath, then it's possible for the membrane to come loose during the healing period and uh, may actually come out completely. So now, after we've irrigated, we're gonna have the patient bite down on some gauze. And that wraps up our extraction of tooth number 19 with ridge preservation grafting. For my post-op regimen for these patients, I will continue them on the chlorhexidine rinse and the cephalexin until they're gone. So with the mouthwash, that's two weeks post-op, and with the antibiotics, that's gonna last them about three more days. At two weeks, the cytoplast sutures come out and then the membrane itself is taken out at six weeks. The cytoplast material is pretty well tolerated, so if the patient can't come in at, at exactly two weeks to get sutures removed, three weeks is fine, even four weeks, and same thing with the membrane. I usually shoot for removal at six weeks, but if the patient has to go a little bit longer, that's fine, uh, but sometimes the membrane will come out by itself early, and that's usually not a big deal either. And here's our patient immediately after removal of the membrane at six weeks post-op. Uh, what happens is you get a layer of granulation tissue that forms between the graft and underneath the membrane, and so when you remove the membrane, you've got this nice layer of granulation tissue that's protecting the graft, and then within a short time, usually a few weeks to a month after the membrane is removed, you find that it's epithelialized over very well with nice, healthy, keratinized mucosa, which is just ideal for when you're gonna place the implant.